Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living podcast at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum coach and teacher, intuitive guide, and above all, an inquisitive soul. This podcast is about how we can bring the various spiritual, metaphysical, and esoteric concepts validated by quantum physics and modern cosmology to the very practical level, to improve and enrich our life experience as individuals, communities, and the humankind. Whether you are listening to this show while driving or commuting, doing chores around the house, relaxing on a couch, or flying in a spaceship across the galaxy, I hope you'll enjoy today's episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. We've got a super episode for you today where we'll explore mysticism in the quantum age. I'd like to take a moment to explain the reason for this intriguing title. If you follow my work through my podcast, blog, website, and my one-to-one work with clients, you know that the angle of my spiritual work and inquiry is defined as being at the intersection of science and spirituality. While I still operate in this space, I also feel that, in spite of my attempt to bring them together and merge, these two concepts remain divisive. On one hand, many people are put off by the word spirituality, which is still strongly associated with religion, and that often implies restrictions, dogma, conspiracy to hide the truth for the purpose of control, and various man-made set of rules and interpretations of our spirit nature that they disagree with. On the other side of the spectrum, most scientists are not allowed or don't allow themselves to be open-minded beyond the scientific rigor and explore the aspects of life that can be measured, quantified, recorded, or otherwise validated in a tangible way. So the cross of science and spirituality poses a dilemma and often creates resistance. Those who cross the line are advised, well, do so at your peril. But also, apart from antagonizing certain populations, I started feeling a bit uncomfortable myself. Like, when you are growing up and your old clothes don't fit anymore, they are just too small and too tight and start breaking up at the seams. I feel like I'm looking at life from a higher perspective than, say, 10 years ago. And from this vantage point, I can see that the concept of science and spirituality doesn't explicitly include the other two elements integral to this narrative mysticism, and esoteric practices. So in this episode, I'd like to take a broader approach and talk about mysticism and esoteric practices in the quantum age, to keep them all together in the contemporary frame of reference, as we are in the quantum age, whether we like it or not. So we can understand and explain divination, witchcraft, remote viewing, theta meditation, and many other practices with quantum science. And who is better to tackle such an intricate topic than my very special guest, Austin Wells. Austin is an author, speaker, mystic, energy healer, spiritual medium, grief counselor, and soul gardener who empowers individuals to create soul-centered lives and connect with the divine. She combines intuition and mediumship with shamanism, energy medicine, and sacred ceremony in her practice. Her book, Soul Conversations, A Medium Reveals How to Cultivate Your Intuition, Heal Your Heart, and Connect with the Divine, received many accolades, including the gold medal from the Nautilus Book Awards. You will find more information about Austin and her work with links to her online presence at quantumlivingpodcast.com. Hello, Austin. Welcome to Quantum Living. It's such a pleasure to have you on my show. How are you? I am wonderful, Anna. Thank you. And what a beautiful 
contemplative, deep, and considered introduction for you and I to step into conversation. Oh, thank you. I did my best. (laughs) This will be an amazing conversation. I just would like to quickly ask you, I understand you have just returned from England, from Wales, where you were running workshops and classes. How did it go? Mm, It was lovely. I have been blessed to go to England many times. This was one of the first times as an educator. My dear friend and colleague, English medium, Robert Brown, invited me to co-teach with him. And we ventured to Wales. The people of Wales are so kind and very spiritually conscious and find mediumship uh, exciting. So we found our group became more popular as more of them knew why we were there and what we were doing. (laughs) So that was really (laughs) fun. But the classes were just stunning. Mm. In my work, it's amazing to meet another practitioner who is so heart-centered as Robert is. So to spend time creating a loving environment where people could face their own limitations and explore beyond their comfort to discover a divine connection and deepen that connection and stay in that space of not knowing to discover how held they are was an absolutely breathtaking experience. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you for sharing. And of course, we will talk more about your your work, your, your offerings, courses, etc. a bit later on. Before we dive into this huge rabbit hole of mysticism in the quantum age, I'd like to ask if you could please tell us a little bit about yourself, your personal story. How did you acquire the knowledge and abilities that you are now sharing with people? I was very blessed, Anna, at a very young age to be aware of a divine presence. When I say divine presence, I'm talking about um, a power greater than myself, a wisdom, an accessible wisdom. I was born into a family with a mother who was not the most nurturing. Therefore, she cultivated in me a great sense of self-reliance. So when I had moments of trepidation and fear, even at a young age, I, for some reason, was hardwired to reach out to that invisible presence. I was in a fashion show. I was about five years old. And I was very nervous because the the outfit they'd given me was a bridesmaid. And I had this voluminous skirt with so much tool that I couldn't see my feet. So I was terrified. I was going to face plant in front of all these people who were fundamentally important uh, to my mom. So I did the only thing I could think of instead of interrupt her in the middle of the night is I asked for help. In that moment, the walls of my room became, became gelatinous and kind of a pulsation through which entities entered these People were see-through, but still had a silhouette of a physical form. I had no fear whatsoever because the energy of the room was loving and kind. A woman came to my side and she spoke to me in an invisible language of what I now understand as spirit communication, the ability to hear and feel and see and taste and touch without words. Uh, that of another's experience. And she said to me that all these people, of which there were probably 40 or 50 people at that point in my room, were all there to support the moment I was in. So I didn't need to tell her what it was. She already knew what it was. So her solution was almost instantaneously once we connected, to my right uh, appeared the runway of the next day. So I was in the time of being in my room and yet I was being shown the alternate reality of the next day and the runway. And I had the ability to step into time, future time, and be in my bed witnessing my future self 
having a very easy time going up the stairs and not tripping, which was my greatest fear. And then once I claimed that confidence, then I started going down the runway, but then they had me become the energy of the audience witnessing this little girl in this huge dress. And I could feel their empathy and their compassion for me. And then they had me become the energy of the entire room and I could feel nothing but love and support. So in that moment, simply by having kind of a somatic experience, that I was not only experiencing as future me, but witnessing as present me. So I was in really two realities at the same time. I knew with deep certainty that there was no way that next day could be a failure. So in that instantaneous realization, I was back in my bed with the woman, less people in the room, but with a deeper sense of certainty that I was going to be okay, which was the whole reason I started praying in the first place. Once she connected with me and affirmed that I was good, then she dissipated back into the walls and I fell asleep. The next day happened very similarly to my vision, not exactly as it did, but very similarly. And from that moment on, I just had this awareness from a, such a young age, first of all, that prayers get answered, that there's an available sense of support and comfort, and that when it's really necessary, that presence is present. Beautiful story. Thank you for sharing. And just very quickly, have you had contact with that woman or those spirits since, or that was a one-off with them? Yes, because that woman uh, became clear to me was my higher self. Oh, how lovely. Yeah. So I actually had my higher self present while my present self and future self were also. So it was a concept that I became more familiar with in shamanic practices of how our soul can shift into different energetic expressions, almost like petals of a flower that they can be sh having a shared experience, but from either different perspectives or different realities. Thank you. Well, that's the mysticism at its best. <laughs> Okay, now let's have a look at these four concepts. Let's call them concepts. Quantum science, spirituality, mysticism, and esoteric practice all together. And I'd like to throw in a few definitions I found online just as a <laughs> bit of an interesting starting point. A mystic in the Catholic Church is a Christian who believes in the possibility of personal understanding of God. And I also found on Oprah.com, how do you know if you are a mystic? You may enjoy occasional bursts of wonder and know what it means to extend the boundaries of a self. And esoteric means mysterious and hard to understand, often understood only by a small group of selected people who keep it in secrecy. So what is mysticism in your understanding and in your own practice, obviously? And could you speak to and give us a, a bit of an overview of the most common esoteric practices and how they all fit together in this paradigm of science and spirituality from your personal perspective? What a juicy question. How exciting. I want to start with quantum science. Mm -hmm. Quantum science is the understanding on a particle level that we as individual souls participate in the becoming of our reality, that it's an interrelational universe. The next concept, spirituality, is the pursuit of something greater than oneself that could be 
God, source, infinite intelligence, but it tends to be with the desire for meaning, for purpose, or for personal understanding. Mysticism is a direct or personal transformative experience that then connects one with the divine. And then esoteric studies is really comes from the Greek word, which means inner. So there's a stunning correlation between those four concepts. One, having the awareness that what you choose, what you choose in your life becomes your reality. Then puts you in a place of wondering what is this greater quanta that I'm surrounded with. And if that quanta, the universe, has an intelligence, then I'm seeking my spirituality, that I want to understand it. Then I'll have a mystic experience or I'll have some transformative experience that affirms the fact that my pursuit on a spiritual level actually is real, like when I was five years old. And then once you start living from the perspective of being able to be in the human body, but also cultivate the gift to me of spirituality is the ability to witness the ability, much like they had me do when I was five years old, I could see myself experiencing something that ability to connect with an ancestor, to connect with God, to have that deeper understanding of an intelligence beyond your own that you can use as a resource, then that transformative experience then invites you into the esoteric practices, which can be anything from meditation to walking in nature, um, somatic experiences, but it also can be found within the Kabbalah, within Sufism, within Tantra, within um, Hermeticism, within Rosicrucian ceremonial magic, astrology, in so many different pathways. So really the beauty of your offering is it's the ability for the individual soul to be awakened to a reality outside of themselves that isn't just a physical human being, it's an invisible presence. Thank you. Well, I love this explanation or point of view because it makes so much sense. And what I'm hearing is that, and I, that's what I really love about it, that there seems to be a linear progression, but it goes in an upward spiral. So it's not linear at some point, all those phases, if you like, of, of our awakening intersect and become one. Oh, I'm loving this. Thank you. Beautiful explanation. I agree with the linear progression. However, sometimes it takes a split. To me, the soul is the human being and the spiritual being merging into one consciousness. It's kind of like a yin-yan symbol. There's part of us that's unconscious and living the human experience and part of us that is absolutely aware of the fact that we're internal. So it's two different conversations at the same time. Sometimes how this awakening happens, how this spiral occurs is when something devastating happens to the human being, a loss of someone, a, a tragic experience, a long-term coma, something where their, their ordinary experience is introduced to something extraordinary and their the way they have been learning, the ways that they have been understanding their reality are no longer fitting the experience they've had, which we could say is a potentially mystic experience, create the awakening that then demands that they get answers that are very different from what is being presented. And you mentioned so cautiously, respectfully, and beautifully how, in, how the, the culture of spirituality is oftentimes aligned with religion. Religion is beautiful. And religion is a context through so many people find this higher source, this power. Where it goes offline is when the humanity within the religion are steering it in a greed direction or in a um, manipulative direction where they are creating a subset of the individual to be part of a collective with a certain mindset that's restrictive and judgmental, which are principles of the human being. When that goes in that direction, then 
it it oftentimes in that situation and someone experiences a loss and the words within that culture create a fear about exploring differently or makes the person feels that that there is shame or blame or guilt about what has transpired it oftentimes will either create that person to dive deeper into that reality or propel them into a personal pursuit, which will lead to a very different mystical experience for them. I have long thought the second coming of Jesus, because Jesus is a phenomenal master teacher, that the second coming of Jesus is when Jesus is personal when it isn't something that we are agreeing to or being taught externally and agreeing with other human beings, it becomes an internal experience that is so personal to us that it allows our own manner of being to be informed by that presence that we are aware of. So no matter what the outside shows, we have a certainty within of that presence. Absolutely. So beautifully said, and on this note, I'd like to make a comment, and I don't mean disrespect for religion or people practicing any religion, but I sense that in the beauty and importance of religion in terms of our connection with the divine, I feel that there is one particular aspect that is disconnecting us from fully understanding the nature of life and reality, and that is when religion claims that God, the divine, the creator, is outside of us, is somewhere out there rather than within us, because we are part of that which we can't fully comprehend, and that you need to go to a special place like a church, not because it facilitates communication and reflection, and but because this is the only place where you can communicate with God. And when priests are the only people who have this special channel, if you like, with, with God. So I feel that this restriction is perhaps the greatest obstacle and the greatest challenge for people to embrace religion without feeling constrained and restricted under the dogma that particular church creates. Would you agree? I hear everything you're saying. I also understand what you're saying. And within the terms of that, I think there are people who are seeking and don't know how to find. So the confines of a place and a space they can go to with a community of people that they can connect to, who either know more than they do or offer um, a light for their dark is helpful. I believe most people's pursuit of God initially is external. And it's everything that we're taught because there seems to be on some levels, a level of blasphemy if we internalize it and have a personal God. And yet in that statement, are we not forgetting that we are of the same ether and energy? And we go back to quantum science, that if the particles within us are part of this beautiful universe with this intelligence, then we are distillations of God with humanity layered on, because this experience of being a human being is meant to be one that is a bunch of fumbles and hopefully some good gains. But we're supposed to be in a place of forgetting what is real and forgetting what is true so that we can have moments that are mystic experiences to be remembered again. I think it's part of the reason why babies can't speak for like the first (laughs) nine months, 10 months, because otherwise they would tell (laughs) us all the things that we forgot. 
So they're <laughs> muted. They're muted in a way, which is probably why they cry too, because they're like, wait a minute, I could help out. <laughs> but I think we have to have that forgetting. Now, perhaps there are people who are blessed to remember and um, never forget. But I, I think it's more the human experience because we buy into the physical so strongly that we forget the invisible, we forget the quantum universe because it's not visible. And because of the power of our vision, we define this world as what is important is what we can touch and what we can own and what we can claim. And then that in, incites our ego and then we have a whole conundrum going on. But churches are, I think, beautiful ideas. And I think there are places and spaces in this world that offer fantastic community and a purity of that understanding of God. But it's important for the culture of the church to retain that childlike innocence and always be in a place and a space of discovery. Um, Richard Rohr is a fantastic Christian mystic who I subscribe to his newsletter, and he writes fantastic daily journals of discoveries of different religions. And what I love about him is he maintains that childlike enthusiasm and wonder that you mentioned about the things he does not know. And if we're ever in a place of claiming we know what is right, I think we have lost our ability to learn. Yes, absolutely. And I can tell you that I am one of those many people who remembered their past lives as a child. I remembered vividly a few of my past lives, in particular the one that on the linear time was just before this one. I was reborn in the same country. I could read the language as soon as I was able to speak without ever being taught because I retained full memory of the country, of the people, of the language, of the culture, and I thought that Everyone did. And I, when I realized that this was not the case, uh, I was very, very surprised and disappointed because I couldn't talk about this with anyone. And when I, whenever I started talking about my life in other life, <laughs> my life experiences in other life, my parents were saying, oh, you know, this is just a dream or, you know, stop inventing things. And so like many children in those circumstances, I was basically being shut down, but I remembered vividly, and I still do. <laughs> now, to bring my earlier comment to a full circle, what is God? When we started talking about what is God, the concept of, of God and the divine, in my view, the contemporary concept of God may be considered as a blend of five traditions and concepts. The mystical traditions of the omnipotent supreme intelligence, the creator of all that is, that is beyond our comprehension and exists outside of us. Then the ancient Roman and Greek pantheons with many gods and goddesses, personified in a human form or in human-like appearance, who had special and different powers. The ancient civilizations and indigenous records of the gods with supernatural powers who came down from the heavens. And I think we now know that they were in fact ETs or extraterrestrials. A scientific proposition of the intelligent quantum field that created the universe and everything in it, which can be studied and understood to an extent, of course. And the modern New Age concept of God as the supreme consciousness that everyone is an integral holographic part of, a fragment, a particle of God. And what's interesting is I feel that whichever concept you accept and look at, 
you will see that this is exactly what God is. And the most important, I think, aspect of it is that we can easily communicate with God just by going within into the heart. Why do you think many paintings of Jesus show him pointing to his heart, saying, this is your way to God? So I feel that all those traditions and all those ancient texts and, and even contemporary concepts of the Creator, God, that supreme intelligence, are really one and the same depending on the angle you look at, at them, like a large crystal ball. And when you look from one angle, you can see different colors. When you look through another angle, you see other colors, but this is still the same energy, the same phenomenon. Would you agree? I love what you said. I love how you connected different ideas, whether polytheistic or monotheistic, to embrace all ideas as not one being correct more than another, but they're, depending on the perspective, just depending on the angle, that there is multiple possibilities within that field of infinite intelligence. And the individual's perception of it is perhaps the definition of God. I think simply put, God is the field of unconditional love and purest potential for all. Absolutely. So what is soul and how can we cultivate our soul in the garden of our life, which I believe is one of your areas of expertise. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Soul garden, please tell us about it. I had to ask myself deeply. I called myself a soul gardener before I realized what soul was. I was given the title soul gardener, and then all of a sudden found myself in the most delicious conundrum. Because when I went to explain what soul was, I realized I had no definition of it. It forged me into a ravenous curiosity and about 500 dry erase boards iterations of trying to understand what had been said about the soul, how it had been defined before, what my own perception of it was, how as a practitioner connecting with ancestors who are out of physical form, what the evolution of the individual human is within the experience, and then the connection to this infinite journey that we're on. So it, it sent me in so many different directions that I almost felt like I had picked a word that was going to take me the rest of my life to figure out. The definition I have at present is we are dualistic in nature. We are a human being who's defined by what is physical and an energetic being which is defined by what we cannot see. The human being has a very specific set of understandings based on being physical and being separate from everything else because of that which can engender ideas of being separate, of being a, a with or against others, and can certainly, because that reality is defined by the physical, make a person very conscious of death because everything physical has a destruction to it. So it brings in emotions, it brings in so much turbulence, and that is the experience of human being. We also don't have a capture of unconditional love yet. I'm still hopeful, but we don't have that capture. So it's um, a truncated individual expression of this distillation of God poured into a limited existence, which is kind of a really kind of funky chemistry experiment. The other part of us is this has infinite awareness that there is no death 
there is a continuum. Everything happens for you as opposed to everything happens to you. And that you're a collective and a part of a grander community and you are all that is. So to put within a, the sphere of an energy field, <laughs> that conversation is, uh, thankfully we're given time to kind of sort that out because those two voices are completely different expressions. You can hear it in people's language when they say things like, well, part of me wants to do this and part of me wants to do this. We are constantly in contrast conversations with ourselves. So the soul to me is the acceptance of the fact that we are dualistic by nature and that if we let our human being only experience the world, there is a very linear, faded, low ceiling experience that still can be magnificent. But at some point within that kind of tunneled experience, there are invitations to dance into the divine and to have transformative mystical experiences that then give a person awareness of a different aspect of themselves. And that's when the remembering begins. And that's when the fullness of a soul begins that recognition. And I really think that's when enlightenment happens, that sense of realizing that you are a light, you are of light and not physical. So the soul is why we are in physical form, but it's the simplest answer I could probably say is, is the individual distillation of the infinite within the human form connecting to the eternal self that always is. Beautiful, thank you. So on this note, and to take this bit further, could you speak to or give us a bit of an overview of some most common esoteric practices? And there are many, obviously. Just to highlight a few a most common that we can engage in and how they can help us connect with our divine self, with our soul. So to bridge that gap and to increase our understanding of our nature as, as beings with that physical and spiritual duality. Are there any particular practices? And I know that, that you, you practice several of them in your own work. So maybe if you like, just focus on those. And I would like to bring this to a more practical level level for our audience. So what could I do? Yes, I would like to explore this further and I would like to reconnect with my higher self or with my soul or understand the duality of my being. What are the key esoteric practices that people might want to try or engage with that will help them get to that next step of their evolution. So beautiful. I love how passionate you are about making what you offer to people, not only satiating on an intellectual level, but inviting and practical on an application level. It's beautiful, Anna. It's so pretty. There are so many different ways to access that intelligence that is beyond your own. Fun ways. Childlike fun ways. Intuitive tools is one of the inroads many people stumble upon, whether it's a tarot deck, an astrology reading. Um, they'll have an experience with a practitioner where somebody knows something about them that they haven't said to them. And that can seem like a very odd experience. My inroad was tarot cards, which I still love to this day, oracle cards. And the invitation must be to have a childlike sense of wonder and invite the possibility that someone, something, a presence, and a loving presence is participating and listening to you. And in that idea, there is this conversation. It's 
why I called my book Soul Conversations, because I wanted to encourage people that there's a listening, there's a an observational aspect happening. So any tool that allows you to kind of play in that idea that there's an invisible reality. So tarot cards are fun. Meditation is amazing. Oftentimes people need to begin with guided meditations to kind of get the permission. The greatest setback we have in exploring anything esoteric is we feel like we have to do it right. The beautiful thing about any esoteric practice is that it is open to interpretation and it's a personal discovery. No one is going to have a similar experience and that begins the journey of understanding that your relationship with the invisible is unlike anything that you can be told what it is or experience. It's so individualized that it will be difficult to capture in words. Meditation has introduced me to how many fields of reality and possibility and levels of imagination and different dimensions and authorities and insights one can gather. People are under the misnomer that meditation is not for everybody. I think convincing yourself of that is one of the saddest things that you could do because find someone, it's part of the reason why I offer a free online meditation every Wednesday night and have for the last five years. I want people to, to find it fun and to understand the loving presence that's available and how healing it is to just go within. But it's all, all the esoteric practices are an invitation inside, which is why esoteric is such a perfect word for it, you know, since it's inner. So it's an inner journey. So anything that allows you a listening somatic experiences, being in nature, anytime you have that feeling of awe and wonder. Nature is phenomenal at that. Nature has a way of making you feel part of something bigger than yourself, which is really that the sense of awe has to be connected with wonder and has to be connected with the awareness of a feeling of something that you're seeing and the two things are so overwhelming that the moment is filled with so much that words can't possibly capture it. That experience becomes more usual as you become acquainted with this powerful presence of spirit. As you mentioned before with this polytheistic kind of approach that the Romans and the Greeks had, what was great about it was it was kind of like um, being at a bar <laughs> and having a whole bunch of different kinds of beer. You've got this beer for this, and this one's got more of this. And it's kind of the way that polytheism mm. worked is there was a God for anger and a God for jealousy and a God for this and a God for that. That makes it very accessible. So I think people think the conversation with God has to be super serious. I do have to say the benefit of working with different realms and realities and having conversations and trusting conversations with the divine. And I hope this isn't too much of an overshare, but I have to say that Jesus has a really funny sense. Oh, absolutely. Um, I was, <laughs> oh my God, I had a, I had a spirit circle years ago and we had spent so many years playing with different energies and entities and um, inviting different ascended masters in. And when Jesus first came in, we were like, oh my God, it's Jesus. Like, <laughs> wow, Jesus. Jesus became very, very much part of our group. So like anyone who has an experience of that level after time, it's like, hey, Jesus is here. Nice. You know, and then you want to move on to something else. <laughs> so we had an experience. It's very human and funny. We had an experience where another ascended master came in and there were nine of us in the group and six of us perceived this new ascended master. And we were talking about how amazing it was. And I felt Jesus standing behind me say, what am I, chop liver? <laughs> and I had to start laughing because we do this with souls. Um, I had another experience that connects with this. Mm -hmm. It's a very different connection where I was working with a group of mediums and training them. And I had picked a person from nature, from history that I wanted them to tap into the soul of. 
and they'd picked up on an energetic child and they'd picked up on playfulness and they picked up on all these beautiful things and that she changed the world and so on and so forth. Well, it was Anne Frank. And the beautiful thing about, and she was so grateful. I'm actually getting chills as we're talking about this. She was so grateful for the exercise because she said, no one asks her to play. Everybody just thinks of her as this very serious, poor girl who went through this big thing. And she said, I got to play and I got to be part of a game. And the beauty of it to me was breathtaking because she was so willing to be participatory like a little girl and just play. So the levels of discovery are unlimited. And the other thing is the spirit world energy and this ex exploration of that, which is mystical or spiritual, is the sense of humor is just yes. overpoweringly fabulous. So it constantly reminds me to not take myself so darn seriously because, um, you know, Jesus is going to come in and make me laugh. Wow, this is so inspiring. Thank you. And before we move on to mediumship, I just would like to make a couple of quick comments. Firstly, it is really important. So thank you for pointing out that no matter what esoteric practice a person chooses to, to engage with or to explore, be it meditation or anything else, Every person's experience is different. There is no right or wrong. There are obviously certain levels you can go through. But as an experience, it is absolutely open-ended. For example, I teach theta meditation, which is the it's very deep meditative state. But there are several different types of meditation, including walking meditation. So you just walk on the beach or in the forest or somewhere in nature and you just go within and you keep walking. And that's your meditative experience. So you are absolutely correct that there is no need to fear or oh, I can't do this. This is some advanced technique, etc. Yes, you can obviously get through the various levels of experience, but there is always an entry level that can be as satisfying and as fulfilling as the most advanced level. And everyone's experience is very different. So thank you for pointing this out because this is really important. And my second comment is that the spirit does have a sense of humor in synchronicities that come into your life. I quite often, I just, I just can't help myself but laugh. It is so ridiculously funny even in direct communication. So I absolutely agree and confirm <laughs> that the spirit does have a sense of humor. And you are absolutely correct. It teaches us, don't take yourself so seriously, because this is really all a game. It's a theater, a theater of your life. And before you know it, you'll be on the next stage and the next stage and a different, in, in a different play. So I totally agree. Now, you started speaking about mediumship, and that's one of my area of interest as well. So I'd like to invite you, if you could please speak to mediumship from the point of view of sharing something with our audience that might be helpful and useful for them to maybe look into it, maybe engage with it, or, or at least consider as one of the esoteric practices. I want to start with the difference between psychic and mediumship. Psychic, uh, all of us have what I call a soul space, an energy field. You use the example of a crystal ball before. If you can think of that metaphor as at least six or seven feet in front of you, to the left, to the right, behind you, below you, and above you, that you're kind of like in this big snow globe. That is the container, it's diaphanous, a container of your soul. And within that space 
is the magical mystery of your personal distillation of the infinite. When a person reads someone psychically, their ability is to perceive that snow globe of your experience and to perceive your human experience in this lifetime and all of the conundrums that you've gotten yourself into. So a psychic can pick up anything from what your childhood was like, who you had love relationships with, what your experience is with money, anything that really has to do with this physical experience. A medium is able to, you could say, energetically juggle multiple snow globes at the same time that connect to the individual that they're reading for. So the mediumistic experience is essentially connecting with this, what they call the sitter or the person that I'm, I'm serving as a medium for and connecting their familial friendly or not so friendly snow globes that have had experience with them in the physical world. Sometimes they're known to them. Sometimes they're ancestors that they've never met. Sometimes they're friends, pets, anything that has had a physical presence in their life, uh, minus furniture. I haven't read for furniture and goldfish. Goldfish, I haven't had a lot of deep conversations with goldfish, <laughs> but I'm so hopeful. Um, but most everything else that um, is animated in some capacity has an ability to be communicatable. So as a medium, it's really no different than a parent that has a child that's at school and they are driving in the car and thinking about the things that they have to get at the grocery store. The child is in one location. That's one snow globe. They've got the future place that they're going in another snow globe. They have the reality of the car that they're in, but they're driving. So as an individual, you're connected to three different things at the same time as while you're doing an action. If you were to replace the circumstances and the child with people in the spirit world, you would understand what it's like for a medium to have connection to different places and capsules of information. So my job as a medium is to connect with that snow globe connected to the individual that I'm reading for and allow that person to utilize my nervous system, which then brings into my brain through my synapses and my senses, the experience of their life to reconnect the individual with someone that they loved or someone who put them through hell. <laughs> <laughs> and it can be all sorts of different relationships. But I find that, again, this infinite intelligence will bring forward in a mediumship sitting the right people for the curative result. We want the proof that life continues and that we're immortal, which is why human beings pursue this because something has ended and we don't understand why and we are at a loss for the continuation. The spirit world, however, knowing that they are eternal, seeks curative results. So their want and wish is different than ours, which is they want to help you be as empowered, healed, and at peace so you can be present to the gift of this life that you are given and uh, present to all that is unfolding in front of you so that you can be in that place and space of being in a mystic state, of being that distillation of God really in pure physical form and then be a voice box for the divine and enhance this place and space. But much as I spoke about the dualism of the soul, part of our existence is getting through the cock a doodle doo that brought us here and all the situations and things that we think define us and finding an ending to the, those chapters and a finishing and a peace so we can discover a different kind of contentment that then can lead us on a spiritual journey of service. Beautiful. Thank you. Which leads me very nicely, it's a nice segue, to my next question. And that's about karma, free will, and destiny. 
I struggled for many years to grasp the paradox or a seeming paradox of karma, free will, and destiny. And it was only a few years ago, like literally a few years ago, that I received a psychic download saying that destiny is a product of free will exercised by the soul in spirit between incarnations. Karma is a product of free will exercised by the human ego during incarnations. Life is a function of destiny, karma, and free will. So essentially this means that as a soul, we always have free will before, after, in between, and during incarnations. However, <laughs> and this comes a big however, I feel that there is one key ingredient that is missing or perhaps hidden in this definition that we forget about until we are pushed into a corner, and that is grace. Grace of the Creator who can change the course of events, rewrite our destiny, and create miracles. Your thoughts, please. Wow. Wow. What a beautifully stated and deeply considered presentation of karma and destiny and free will. I love the addition of inside of physical form, having one experience and the understanding of the witnessing external form and destiny. They are predicated by a person's understanding, a soul's understanding of their relationship with the universe. Destiny, free will, and karma are not something that a human being without a mystical experience or a sense of spirituality is going to entertain. Karma being a Buddhist term initially, uh, meaning that actions have effect and that there is personal responsibility for that is something that is acted out within a physical life. Destiny seems to imply that there is some sort of overreaching vision of a soul within a lifetime, prior to a lifetime. Fate seems to infer that there's no choice, that it's set out and you just go forward and that's it. And then free will is this whimsical perception that anything can happen. Free will, I believe, is the intersection of the divine. When a person is reminded that they are not fated, that they are led, that they co-create, and that although there might be a defined fate, there is a potential destiny, multiple destinies, and that karma is part of the agreement, part of the personal responsibility, part of the initial invitation of the life, but not necessarily the only discoveries within the life. Hence, what I was talking about with feeling like there's a front loading of experiences that we have to understand and navigate through in order to reach a point where I feel that our free will becomes much more activated and our part co-participation in the events of our lives create magical destinies that are far greater than a faded line. But fate does exist because certain people, I believe, are meant to have different levels of unconsciousness because it inspires people to have greater consciousness and affect change. So all of those components dance together. The greatest sadness for me is the percentage of souls, carnate souls, who agree to a narrow perception of what's possible and agree that other people determine their lives 
and the outcomes, that to me is fate. Fate is when you feel that there is you're constricted in your growth. There is nothing in the quantum universe that agrees with anything else but expansion. So within the concept of mysticism and spirituality and all the things that we're talking about, you know that you are living in that lane when things become expansive, when your curiosity can't be quenched, when books have a certain level of knowledge, but there's a different level of discovery. So destiny is the invitation to dance with pure potential and destiny becomes really almost a blank canvas once you surrender to the idea that anything is possible and that alignment comes when you start understanding your divine nature. Wow. Thank you. I'm loving I'm loving your point of view. It's very profound and at the same time very logical. And what I especially love is your introduction of the concept of fate into karma free will destiny. There is fate as well and there is a difference between destiny and fate. It's a nuanced difference, and yet there is. And I also love you pointing out that karma is a, it's an invitation to recognize and exercise our role as co-creators of our destiny. And I feel that once someone can grasp even just that part, that you are a co-creator of your destiny of this lifetime, and you can use your free will as a tool. This places the onus of responsibility on us for creating our reality. And I know many people hate this word. (laughs) Oh, I'm responsible. Having said that, there are a couple of caveats. And one of the caveats is that, yes, there is a generic blueprint. Let's call it fate. So, If someone decides, and again, this is an execution of free will. If I decide, well, I can't be bothered. I don't want to make any effort. And I just go through my life on automatic, go to bed, wake up, do whatever I need to do, (laughs) eat, (laughs) go back to sleep, basically don't engage with life and don't explore life. That's still my choice. That's still my my right, if you like, as the co-creator of my destiny. Another caveat is, And I call this non-negotiables. I believe that every person has on their fate pathway, certain experiences at certain points in time that they have agreed to go through for the broader evolution of their soul. And those can't be changed. And they agreed at the soul level that they will go through those experiences regardless. So I call them non-negotiables. And I think that usually a person might have a handful, maybe three, four, five in the course of their lifetime, such experiences, some of which might be pleasant and positive, some might be very hard lessons. But apart from those few non-negotiables, I feel that we can negotiate pretty much everything else. And the tool that we have, which you have so beautifully explained, is our free will. So I'm loving, loving, loving this presentation and this explanation. So thank you. And I am positive that our audience will also love it because it just explains everything. It's it's almost like the recipe for life. Okay, so thank you. I would love to I would love to add something to the non-negotiables because I love that concept. Yes, please come another on. way that there is a non-negotiable is in the way that a person passes for some instances, for instance, something like what occurred within the United States with 9-11. I feel that there are certain times when there is a mass exodus and that is within the soul path. 
And sometimes it's in alignment and sometimes it's something that happens absolutely out of left field, but it's just part of a greater learning, a greater experience. And the non-negotiables also with the idea of past life awareness also can be woven in as necessary evolutionary pieces that might not have been made apparent, stepped into, or claimed on a personal responsibility level in a past life experience that then are woven into an experience to create um, an opportunity for the individual to have a different level of either atonement with an individual that they wronged in another lifetime or to have a different opportunity to respond with different insight in another experience. Yes, absolutely. Beautiful. I'm loving it. I'm loving everything, everything you you, sh- you are sharing with us. So thank you so much. So on this note, would you like to tell us a bit more about your work, your programs, your offerings, and I will include all the links in the show notes so people can connect with you. So could you please speak briefly to this? Thank you. Thank you, first of all, Anna, for such a considered conversation. I appreciate your preparation. I appreciate your mindfulness, and I really value the passion that you have to want to help people open their hearts and minds to things that are beyond what is easily accessible or commonly conversed upon. So thank you for such a real and passionate conversation. It's just been such a delight. And thank you for the opportunity to talk about my work as well. It shouldn't be about cross-marketing. It should just be about the opportunity to converse. But thank you for the ability to do that. I have been blessed to do this work for over two and a half decades now. I love it with my soul. I love empowering individuals to cultivate their intuition, heal their hearts, connect with the divine. So that is the pathway through which my work follows. I have a free meditation that you can find on my website, austinwells.com, and Austin is with a Y, that you can join. There's nothing except for an email exchange because I want to be able to tell you if I'm traveling, I'm not going to be able to partake in a Wednesday night, but we have a cultivated a group for five years now. And it means the world to me. It's my desire to be present for people. There's no financial responsibility, except for it's just a free offering and it's awfully fun. So that's 6 PM Pacific time on Wednesday nights. I work individually with people, with mediumship, with soul gardening, working as a representative of that spiritual presence when you might be going through a moment when um, the lights are harder to see and the darkness feels more prevalent. I teach mediums how to connect with the divine. That's with the mediumship practicum class that I teach monthly, but you can find on Eventbrite. You can also find it on my site. I have a class coming up that I'm very excited about called Celestial Navigation. I teach it every fall, and it's a multi-week class that is live, (laughs) and it is connecting with all the guardians and angels and guides and ancestors that are around. I love the timing of the class because it always correlates with Day of the Dead, which is one of my favorite holidays that the um, Hispanic cultures utilize as a way to celebrate their loved ones. And it's done with whimsy and humor and open grieving, which is something we need to be better at. I do spend time with people on grief levels because I'm a multiple certified grief counselor, which is very important to me. And just as a note for anybody seeking a medium, they should be really clear on the grief journey and know when to help you find extra help on the off chance your grief is complicated. So find someone who's schooled, passionate, and moral, and has high integrity, because it's very easy to access information on the internet now. 
and I won't, I can't do it. My, I can't do it. It, it has to be authentic. So I am fine with being wrong just to prove the fact that I don't cheat. I don't believe in that. And there's, there's people that do. So be discerning. Um, trust that your loved ones shouldn't be a conversation on the street with someone that you cross paths with. It should be an honored and a sacred conversation. I also do retreats. I have a trip coming up to Egypt in March. So I'm blessed to work internationally, nationally, individually, collectively, with people and my greatest desire is to help people exactly Anna find the things that we're talking about, which is this personal sense of the infinite within and create that bridge because with that capture, with that understanding, we are the best versions of ourselves. And if we are at peace, we can be peaceful for others and hold space for them in whatever situation that they're in. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow, you are a beautiful human being and a beautiful soul. I know that people can see you on this recording, but you are projecting such a beautiful, loving energy and light. I'm so grateful that we have finally connected. Now, before we close this beautiful conversation, I have one final question for you. If a genie granted you three wishes, <laughs> a genie question, <laughs> one for the world, one for all other people on this planet, and one for yourself, what would they be? The answer is simple, and it's one word, love. I just knew you would say that. <laughs> it's the it is the answer to everything. It's the only solution. It's the only answer. And it should be the only question. So three wishes combined to one love for everyone. Thank you so much for your beautiful presence. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you, Anna, for your loving presence. Because it is, like I said, your listeners are so fortunate to have someone that cares this deeply to cultivate the right kind of contact, the right kind of conversation, and the right kind of content. And I see you and I value you and I am grateful for this opportunity. So thank you for reaching out to me. Thank you so much again. That was so very special. God bless and namaste. If you'd like to find out more information on this topic, please visit my podcast website at quantumlivingpodcast.com where I included in the show notes for this episode a list of the key esoteric traditions and practices you might like to explore. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me, and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then... Keep your vibrations high and be well.